This program was made possible by the Florida Humanities Council. We come from all over, and we become one state, where we share in the history and become part of the culture that is Florida. The Florida Humanities Council, bringing Floridians together by sharing the stories of our state. And by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you for your presence this evening. And we hope to take you on a journey in time. This unique pleasure is being provided through the Florida Humanities Council, formerly the Florida Endowment of the Arts, which is funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the State of Florida, and private contributions. The Florida Humanities Council initiates and supports public programs throughout Florida, exploring human cultures, histories, and value. We ask you to show your appreciation for this program by taking time to complete the evaluation forms which have been left on your seats. This will let the Humanities Council know that they are reaching you and what need uh, they might serve in the future. Here with us this evening from the Florida Humanities Council are the following people. I'm going to introduce them and then I'm going to ask the coordinator or the sponsor for uh, this forum such, such as the one that you're going to enjoy tonight to come forward and introduce our, our scholar. Here with us this evening from the Florida Humanities Council are Ms. Lori Berlin, who is the Director of Administration. Lori, will you stand? Right here. Oh, she's back at the door. There's Renee Renfro, Reno, I'm sorry, Renee. And the person who's been working with me and holding my hand along the way to get us to this end, Ms. Phyllis McEwen. Phyllis. Would you come forward, please? Let's give her a round of applause. Well, good evening. I'm so glad to see everybody out today. And we are so pleased to be here in Lakeland at the Coleman Bush Center. And uh, we come here to do parallel lives with great excitement. We've worked very hard on this, as I always say. This is not fast food set to get tonight. This is a long pot. And all y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? A nice long pot. It represents a lot of hard work and a lot of generosity on the part of our writers, Beverly Coyle and Bill Maxwell. And we really appreciate them for all this hard work and for revealing parts of their lives that many people will never even talk about. It's not an easy thing to talk about. Many people are in denial about it. Many people want to forget some of the things that you'll be hearing tonight. Now, uh, as our director said, the Florida Humanities Council is the Florida office of the National Endowment of the Arts. Uh, I'm sorry, the humanities. And we are so pleased to be able to bring programs like this that deal with cultural diversity, the history of race relations, and uh, give Floridians a chance to come out and have public forums about the humanities like this. We'll be doing this tomorrow in Bartow. We have our sponsor here, uh, Mr. Clifton Lewis. Uh, we'll be at the Bartow Public Library at 7 o'clock tomorrow. And um, I think that you are going to see that programs like this are very necessary and very powerful, and we'll be doing this uh, throughout the state. I'm not sure what our next schedule will be, but it will be uh, publicized soon. But to guide us through this terrain, this humanities public programming discussion about the history of race relations in 1950s Florida, we have a very special guest with us, Dr. Cantor Brown. Many of you already know Dr. Cantor Brown. Um, he is a native of Polk County, born in Bartow and raised in Fort Meade. He is a product of the Polk County Public Schools he received a Juris Doctor from Florida State University and then a PhD in history. Uh, and then in 1985, he left the practice of law to go into his love of history. And that is where he has been working since then. He has authored or co-authored 10 books uh, on the topic. Um, a couple of them are, uh, let's see. 
Florida's Peace River Frontier. Florida's Peace River Frontier. I think his latest book is A Black Public Officials, 1867 through 1924. He is currently a historian in residence at the Tampa Bay History Center. And now we have Dr. Cantor Brown to work with us through this terrain of parallel lives. very much. I, I know those of you who've heard me talk before or else know me uh, as a longtime friend know it's an absolute delight to me anytime I get an excuse to come back to Pope County. Uh, I love growing up here. I love my home in Fort Meade and I, I just treasure the friendships that have lasted throughout my life uh, that came from being a native of Pope County. So thank you very much for giving me the excuse to come home tonight. Uh, what I have been asked to do is really a two-part thing. I'm going to introduce our guest tonight, uh, although before that I'm going to give a very brief introduction into the subject of race relations here in Polk County. Then after they have uh, uh, given their uh, talks with you, uh, I'm going to come back and kind of moderate questions. Uh, from you to them over about a half an hour period. So you'll see me again uh, after the talks. Uh, in terms of Polk County, we have had a fascinating struggle with and love affair with the idea of race relations for almost two centuries in this county. Uh, many people do not realize that African Americans have lived in this county since the year 1818. Uh, the whites took another generation to get here, not arriving until the mid-1840s. Uh, but since that time, we, as I mentioned, have alternated uh, in our desire to find a common road through life and also an antagonistic relationship often spurred by white uh, oppression of African American citizens here. It is very little known that from this county in the year 1835 was planned and started the largest slave rebellion in United States history. On the other hand, this county became one of the most violent counties per capita uh, uh, in racial terms at and after the turn of the century. Horrible racial crimes were committed in this county. On the other hand, in this same county, all of you who've lived here for a while know how complicated we like to make every single thing we possibly can. In this county also, whites arm themselves and their black neighbors to defend the rights of African Americans to vote. So our picture is a complicated one here, and it stretches back, as I said, over almost 200 years. But in our lifetimes, I'm roughly the same age as our speakers, uh, in our lifetimes, we remember the seeming permanence when we were young of the system of Jim Crow racial segregation and legalized racial discrimination. Uh, we can also remember the beginnings of the civil rights movement here and the attempts to change dramatically and permanently that system which attempted to enforce a second class citizenship upon African Americans in this county. And what our speakers tonight are going to share with us is the story of their coming of age, both in terms as individual human beings in Florida during that civil rights era, uh, where we in Pope County, just as they were in their homes, were beginning to struggle uh, with the concept of righting this great wrong that had existed here. Uh, and they're also going to share with us their growing sensitivity to both the need to change those relationships and the complications involved in understanding and changing those relationships. Uh, I had the very great honor and pleasure last Saturday night uh, to have a sneak preview uh, of their talks. Uh, and I can assure you that you are going to be absolutely entranced with what they have to say. But before I introduce them, I wanted to close these few remarks just by mentioning that listening to them reminded me of a poem that I had read some years ago. It was written 
by John Wilkes Menard, who was the first African American elected to the United States Congress. He was not seated in the Congress, and so he moved to Florida in the early 1870s. He became a justice of the peace here, he became a state legislator here, and he became probably the most distinguished of all the African American editors <coughs> in Florida. Uh, in the process, he also became a published poet. Uh, and after his years of struggle, uh, after his coming to grips with the nature of public debate, of uh, interracial debate, uh, he wrote a little poem uh, that I think touches very much on the tone and meaning uh, of the conversations that you will hear tonight. If you'll pardon me, I, I would like to read it for you. This was published in 1879 in Florida. It is entitled, Speak to Me Kindly. Oh, speak to me kindly. Harsh words have no power. They touch not the heart in its sorrowing hour. Kind words fitly spoken reach down to the heart and with secret power bid its sorrows depart. Oh, speak kindly ever in sunshine and storm. It will soften rude cares and keep the heart warm. Then speak to me kindly, dear friend of my heart, and from thy sweet presence I'll never depart. John Willis Bernard. Bill Maxwell, our first guest. I get to do this two nights in a row, and so I'm going to introduce Bill first tonight and Beverly tomorrow night. <laughs> the equal time. Uh, Bill is an editorial writer, as many of you know, for the St. Pete Times. Uh, he has worked for any number of other major news organizations, including the Gainesville Sun and the New York Times Syndicate. Uh, he originally served as an investigative reporter for the Fort Pierce Tribune in Fort Pierce, where he focused on labor and migrant farm worker issues. Uh, he has numerous awards, including awards from the Florida Press Club, Lincoln University, and the American Trial Lawyers Association. He is a native of Fort Lauderdale, although you will learn tonight that he grew up in Crescent City, Florida, in Putnam County. Uh, he graduated from Bethune-Cookman College in 1971 with a bachelor's degree in English and history. Now, he did do a few things immediately after that. He earned a master's degree in English language and literature from the University of Chicago. He then attended the University of Florida School of Journalism. Uh, he began teaching English at Kennedy King College in Chicago. He thereafter taught English and journalism for 20 years before joining the St. Petersburg Times. He, should I say how old you are, Bill? He's 53 years old and proud of him. Uh, he says he's earned every single gray hair in his head. He has a daughter, a son, and a grandson, and truly one of the most distinguished journalists working in Florida today, Bill Maxwell here. I think everyone here who has followed Bill's writings in the St. Petersburg Time, Times will agree that at times they reach the level of literature. Well, our other author tonight is known purely, uh, well not solely, but, but certainly for her great talent at literature as well as at teaching. Beverly Cole was born and raised in Florida. She is 52 years old a fifth-generation native of Florida on her mother's side. We have to be cousins, I know. Um, her people came from Lake City and Oviedo. Uh, she began the first grade in Boynton Beach, where, as she herself notes, her eight-room schoolhouse is now a museum. Now, this is a concept, by the way, that many of us can share when we look back at things we're very familiar with and now considered quaint. Uh, so, uh, she moved around quite a lot growing up for reasons that she will explain to you in her talk. But she graduated from Venice High School and later Florida State University before taking a teaching fellowship at the University of Nebraska. Uh, she also received her Ph.D. there in 1974. She taught, now how in the world this happened, I don't know. But she started out teaching in New South Wales, Australia. Uh, and then became an assistant professor at Vassar College in 1977. She now holds the Mary Augusta Scott Chair of Literature at Vassar College. 
Not bad, really. <laughs> and lives in New York City with her husband. Uh, her fiction, uh, for which she is nationally viewed, uh, reflects her foreign roots. She's the author of three novels, The Kneeling Bus, In Troubled Waters, and most re recently, Taken In. All three are published by Viking Penguin Press and are used in high schools and colleges throughout the country. Uh, she noted that especially the University of Tampa required her, bu uh, her book, The Kneeling Bus, as a common text for all entering freshmen. Uh, in Troubled Waters is the story of four family members, one of whom is haunted by his 1920s family ties with the Ku Klux Klan. The New York Times placed this novel on its 1993 notable books list. The American Library Association placed its, my books don't get this kind of trick, <laughs> placed it on its 1993 10 best novels list. Uh, and on and on and on. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the distinguished teacher and author Beverly Corbett. And perhaps the first inkling 
of what kinds of things were going to happen around the table of white folks in those days happened around a table. Once we were visiting my mother's people in Oviedo, and my fearless grandparents let my parents know that while he loved and supported them as good people, and whether they knew it or not, the Methodists were one of many organizations now infiltrated by the Communist Party. <laughs> My mother ran from the table in tears. Dad, the son-in-law, sat there and stared at his food. The Civil Rights Movement was the next phrase, it seems to me, out of my father, my grandfather's mouth. The civil rights movement was underway, and the communists were behind it. They were under every bush. I was born August 2nd, 1946, about nine months to the day after my daddy got back from World War II. My first memories are Boynton Beach, where dad had one of his early churches. And we moved about every four years to a new church within the Florida Methodist Conference. So, my next stop was Jacksonville. And the next stop after that, Fernandina Beach. And then Nokomis, Venice. And our home, <coughs> our home base, of course, in Oviedo. And these were my hometowns. And historically, as uh, Professor Brown told you, Lake City, where a great, great grandparent was born. My father was North Alabama, South Tennessee. His people were tenant farmers who he essentially left behind after managing to slip away first to college, then to Methodism, and then to my mother who graduated from Florida Southern College right here in Lakeland. We're very proud of that. And I can't go much further without telling you that she's here today. <laughs> um, and I will introduce her. I think that my father and she through him were truly liberalized by radical Emory in Georgia. <laughs> and that my father had very much a scholarly view of the Bible and a very spiritual one. He had a good mind and a keen sense of injustice, and I'm going to add with caution because I think it's important here. I don't think that he was religious in the way that Hollywood often portrays the Southern um, white minister of the day. As I came to consciousness in around nine or ten, this position of my father's and mother's put tremendous burden on me in terms of Christian service. I've gone through my adult life thinking over and over the way you just do about certain things that youth hymn of the day as simple as it was I hear it and sing it now Jesus loves the little children all the children of the world red and yellow black and white and I heard all those colors they are precious in his sight Jesus loves the little children of the world and then that later, for me, uh, more sophisticated text in a way, I was starting to take it apart. If a man has two coats, he ought to give one of them away. I grew up in fear of our excesses. This was Florida. I didn't even have a coat. But I had a lot of sweaters. And I felt it was wrong that I had more than, way more than one sweater. I knew that even in our modest lifestyle, we had way too much. I was born in Fort Lauderdale, October 16. I was born in Fort Lauderdale, October 16, 1945, at the All Negro Hospital in Fort Lauderdale. Negro babies could not be delivered to the white hospital. My parents were farm workers, and they labored hard and long, but they could not make ends meet all the time. When I was 18 months old, Broward County's pole being cropped was devastated by heavy rains. My parents had to go up north 
to pick potatoes. On the way out, they dropped me off in Crescent City to stay with my grandparents, where I lived with them until 1963 when I went to college. Crescent City is between the Latin and the land on U.S. Highway 17. It's on the eastern rim of the Ocala National Forest, less than 40 miles inland from the Atlantic Ocean. It is home to Lake Stella, Tiny Lake Regenta, and Crescent Lake. Crescent City was not a utopia. It was, however, and I'm speaking only of the Negro areas because I did not have close contact with local whites. It was a very black version of paradise, where Negro children, mostly boys, roamed the woodlands and fields, bare feet, without a care, where Negro girls dressed in gingham dresses, skin rope, <coughs> and the live oak, magnolia, and camphor trees. And back then, citrus, fern, and pulpwood gave most Negroes steady jobs. The eccentric could keep got a living putting in deer tunnel, Spanish moss, and gopher tortoises, Hoover chickens. <laughs> My grandparents' house was a green, single, three bedroom, shotgun style structure with a matching two hole outhouse across the dirt road. <laughs> you all know about outhouses? On three acres of sandy soil, we grew all the fruit and vegetables that we needed. We had no cows or pigs, but our chickens laid enough eggs for five families. Religion the real fear of a living God who at will intervenes in earthly matters anchored the lives of the adults. My grandfather was a presiding elder in the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar ground of the truth without controversy, the real small church. <laughs> <laughs> he also was a pastor of three congregations, one in St. Augustine, one in Philadelphia, and in Crescent City. He routinely conducted or participated in tent revivals throughout the state. And I accompanied him on these trips when my grandma was too plump tired to go with him. Sometime around 1959, the idea of the shopping center was born. And I don't want the young people to mistake this for a mall. <laughs> but it was the beginning of that idea. One day, my whole family found itself in the parking lot. That's what made the shopping center so new, that vast <laughs> parking lot inviting cars to come. A black family pulled up a car alongside of ours. All the adults stood around about waiting. Most of us kids climbed up on the hoods of the car because what we were there for was to see the grand opening of this shopping center, and they were going to give us a show. But it looked like it was going to take forever to begin. When it finally did, big spotlights came on, and we all watched a young white girl climb this tremendous ladder, 50-foot ladder. Suddenly there was a drum roll to get the excitement building. An assistant already perched at the top of this ladder helped the young girl set fire to her gasoline-soaked life jacket. We held our breaths as she turned to face us, placing her head, hands over her head, and then diving straight down into nothing more than a small tank of water. We all cheered and hooted at his feet. And then we left our cars and went into these new stores, set up like a, a new town. And we bought things. Together, corporate America had seized on our only colorblind arena money. Shopping centers gave blacks and whites a space to hang out together after a fashion, and I think it was there that I had my first images, and this is incredible for me to say, of blacks and family units. Family units like my own. If you really want to maintain Jim Crow, then a shopping center is, is a very big mistake. In the shopping center, there was the beginning of irony in those signs over the soda fountain counters, and I didn't know about sit-ins. The new signs read, 
We reserve the right to refuse service. Remember those signs? We reserve the right to refuse service. This was new. <coughs> and it was language, of course, to renew the color-coded whites only. Colored also. But the fact that the restaurant counters and owners had devised this slightly legalized sound, reserve the right, mark the desperation behind it, it seems to me, and it sounded one of the first death knells of Jim Crow. <clears throat> if a white family could walk around us eating an ice cream cone in this relatively new common space, it made far less sense why they could not sit down while well, we could all walk around together and half of us could sit down and the other half couldn't. Shopping centers were spaces that caused me to see freshly what I hadn't been able to see. It caused, and I know the young people in the room will find this incredible, but how else to describe it? The born <coughs> into the accepted fact that looked like to a young child peaceful and agreed upon removal of blacks from our lives. Uh, let me just say that uh, I'm going to read now and uh, maybe thank you so we also uh, sit back and to listen. The right morning sun was blazing hot. My grandfather and I drove to the Putnam County Courthouse in Alaska. I was excited because I was about to start the paperwork for getting my driver's license. I stayed up all night dreaming of my driving my grandparents' 1949 Chevrolet, of showing off in front of the girls in Crescent City, <laughs> of wearing exotic cologne, and holding my wrist dangerously loose over the steering wheel. <laughs> I had seen my father and other men do around women. <laughs> all, always the women, right? <laughs> And of course, I dreamt of owning my own sporting coat. The year was 1959, and that's the year that that picture there was taken. I was a few months away from being old enough to drive legally. My grandfather, Robert Harris Bentley, and I climbed the courthouse stairs, moving aside to let three white women pass. At the counter, a clerk, an older white woman with eyes that instinctively looked through Negroes, without seeing their humanity, gave me a form to fill out. My grandfather sat in a chair beneath the ceiling fan, his hat resting awkwardly on his lap. An armed sheriff deputy, a tall white man with a ruddy face and hairy arms, stood beside me. Leaning on the counter, he chatted with the woman, studied me from head to toe, and glanced over at my grandfather. The room was hot, and I was nervous. When the woman asked if I had a pen, I said, no, I don't. I had no idea that those three simple words had violated two centuries of strict tradition and had exposed me to the senseless oath that required a white man to protect the honor of a white woman, especially when the honor had been trampled on by a Negro. As I reached for the pen that she was handing to me, the deputy grabbed my left shoulder, spun me around to face him, shoved my back against the wall, and pressed his forearm against my chest. You say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, to a white lady, you little nigger. He said in a deliberate tone, his breath smelling of tobacco. Never will I forget the way he said nigger and the rage in his eyes. Over the years, I have relived this incident, assessing my reaction to it at that time and measuring his long time effect on who I have become. Doubtless, it was a watershed in the life of a 14 year old Negro, a muscular football star, a happy teenager who saw himself growing quickly into manhood. Now, I look back and marvel that given the racial customs of that time, when a white and white men believed that they had a God-given right to do anything they pleased to Negroes, I was lucky to have escaped physically unharmed. 
weighing about 190 pounds and standing nearly six feet, I stiff armed the deputy as I routinely did the opposing football players who tried to tackle me when I ran the football. I caught him off balance and he went down. He went back, I'm sorry, stumbling to hold himself up. Keep your hands off me, I shouted. There was one more word in there that I can't use. <laughs> Unaccountably, I was unafraid, only insulted and angry. He grabbed the edge of the counter and balanced himself. I looked into his eyes, knowing that he wanted to shoot me. I believe now that he started to reach for his handgun, but he did not. Perhaps I, I imagined the hesitant down the movement of his hand for the weapon. But I did not imagine the heat of bigotry in his eyes, the heavy burden of being on the superior race. As I stared at him, he looked away, turned to my grandfather and said, get this little troublemaking nigger out of here. He thinks he's Martin the King of somebody. Don't call me a nigger, I shouted, moving toward him. By now, my grandfather, a gentle man infused with the serenity of the deeply devout, was trembling. Jumping to his feet, he pulled me down the hallway, out the building. Terror <coughs> in his eyes as we passed the Confederate Heroes Monument on the front lawn. In the car, he did not look at me, nor did he speak to me. He drove 26 miles back to Crescent City in silence. When he died four years ago, we had not discussed that day, and I can only guess at his reason for never talking about it. But I know what it did to me. It introduced into my young consciousness a sense of personal vulnerability and mortality. Until then, I had been like other children. I believed that I, would, that I was invincible and would live forever. But on that day, there I stood in that muddy courtroom, facing a man who wanted to annihilate me who could have annihilated me with the squeeze of a finger. Why would he have done so? Because my skin was black. Because I forgot the lay of the land and stepped out of my place when I did not say ma'am to a white woman. Even at that age, I understood that my fate was in the hands of a total stranger, a white man, an adult, who despised me, a mere child, for no logical reason. I clearly understood that life in the South was unfair, that being a Negro in Northeast Florida was a high-risk game of minimizing physical assaults. Even more, though, I walked away from that courthouse with an altered psyche and a diminished sense of self, conditions that I would spend the rest of my years trying to repair. Indeed, the courthouse encounter was a turning point for me but it was also the fulcrum of my growth, the point of support from which I can now appreciate the wholeness of my life. In other words, all the events that occurred before that day in Galacta prepared me for surviving it. I loved shopping center. I could go there with a few dollars and buy a ton of trash. About every four years, we packed up barrels of dishes and pots and pans and clothes and bedding, and photographs and books and my father, my mother's Fostoria and silver. My trinkets would always get pitched. We were clergy. We were supposed to be free of extraneous stuff with each new move to a, to a parsonage, and they were furnished. In Fernandina Beach, the parsonage there had a pink vanity table in the room. Sorry, this is wobbling on me, so I'm having this feeling that this is about to go over the edge. Um, this pink vanity became mine. It was in the room that became mine in the summer of 1959. I was 13. This vanity table had two sets of doors on either side, and the middle of it was sunken where you could keep your toiletries. Even then, I had to be somewhat aware 
of the table's symbolic meaning beyond being just a piece of furniture. As a girl, I was supposed to do the very best with what God had given me. Only maidens and novels were reported to be naturally beautiful without any help. I was to think positively, look bravely into that mirror, and work at it. It was on this vanity table that I forged my mother's name to a note. I needed my mother's express permission to check out Gone with the Wind from the new junior high library. You might think back then in Jim Crow days that a southern white school would require parental permission on a book about the Civil War or any, any facet of it. Uh, this was Florida. We were the first state in many ways to forget the Civil War, and I'm saying this ironically as a debatable point, but all that money that came pouring into Florida after the Civil War sure helped my great-grandparents put it behind. Rather, the school just wanted to make sure that it was okay by my parents that I be allowed to learn all on my own what Scarlett O'Hara had done with all that God had given her. <laughs> by making it just a little bit illegal for me to get hold of that stuff, the collective community, unknown to itself, found a way to assure that I did get hold of it, and I forged that note without batting an eye. At the time I was doing this, I was resisting long looks into the mirror. 13, remember, remember 13? The mirror was not giving me back what I wanted to see, <laughs> even when I worked really hard. However, I was doing quite a bit of staring into the beautiful eyes of Johnny Mathis. I had all his albums to date. I found the albums in the shopping center. I would sit and look at his face, three versions of it, each more handsome and stunning than the other. Try as a separatist culture might, it can only do so much to arrange a view of the world, thank goodness. Reality will burst through all the wrapping put around white people, especially white girls. Here was a, a black man on the front of an album looking right at me, permitted in a way to look at me. <coughs> I had no idea black men couldn't do that and live at that time. Or maybe I did have some idea. But I look back now and I realize that Elvis Presley scared me. And I knew in real life he would have rejected me. <laughs> Pat Boone would have just patted me on the head. John Mathis, what? I was precious in his sight. John and Mathis loved the children of the world. One of the remarkable events of my early childhood involving white people occurred when I was 10 years old went with my grandfather to a three-day revival in Lake City, where Beverly was from. Pilgrims came from several near, nearby counties. On the second afternoon of the gathering, a group of boys and I walked to our store in the Negro neighborhood. I bought my usual frosted ball of knee-high grape soda, a bag of salted peanuts, <laughs> Returning to the tent, we uh, rocked house and played the dozens and fantasized about pretty girls as we crossed the railroad tracks. Out of nowhere, before the Ford pickup roared toward us, I could hear the horn blasting and the rebel yells. Three white teenage boys sat in the cab and five or six brought in the, the bed. We knew what was coming because, although we came from different parts of the state, we had seen this potentially deadly game before. We were about to be nigger knocked. As the adults in our lives had taught us, we ran in different directions to confuse our attackers. 
I had been nigger knocked a year earlier on my newspaper route in Crescent City. I was pedaling my bicycle along and about to throw a toss a paper to a yard when a woody carrying three white boys approached. The passenger in the back seat hit me in the face with a balloon filled with urine. On that day in Lake City, I knew immediately that I had doomed myself by looking back. A boy in the back of the truck held another belt in the air, the silver bubble twirling above his head. And suddenly I saw the bubble descend. And just as suddenly everything went black. Pain ripped through my face. Cupping my nose, I smelled my own blood and felt it pouring into my palms and between my fingers. I thought that I would pass out and I had lost both knives. After several of my companions returned to help me, I was surprised that I could see it all. My nose had been broken and the gash was deep enough to reveal bone. My friends helped me back to the tent where I was born. The standing room only crowd was shouting to the syncopated sounds of drums, the piano, and tambourines. My grandfather was in the makeshift pulpit with, with other preachers. He saw me and ran toward me. The eyes of the crowd followed. I stood in the aisle holding the bridge of my nose. The front of my starched white shirt was covered with my own blood. The wife of the local minister with whom we were staying took me to her house, flushed my wound, bandaged it, and gave me one of her husband's shirts to wear. That night, my grandfather drove me to the Negro doctor in Gainesville. That incident made me fully aware of Negro estrangement. In fact, white people were a mystery to us in Crescent City. They were strangers. We would see them downtown, I'll catch a glimpse of them driving their cars and trucks. Some of us took orders from them at work, but we rarely saw their faces up close. I'm grateful to my parents, who were both professionally and honestly a long distance from racial epithet, from acts of harassment, vindictive discrimination. Nothing like that passed from the lips or hearts of them. And we were a generation removed from the family members involved in more violent things and everyday acts of intimidation and for submission. But had those acts been more fully discussed with me as real, I would have had a better way of interpreting my everyday images and this complete removal of blacks from our lives. Of course I saw black people. Men off in the fields, gathered alongside sandy graves, waiting to go home. They worked for my farming grandparents. I visited at Christmas time. I'd see the lone woman walking by herself into a white neighborhood to cook and clean. I would eye with curiosity our gentle janitor all alone in school, keeping to himself, quietly eating his lunch in that airless room where the school stored the red disinfectant sawdust. I would eye the black faces looking down from the balcony of my neighborhood theater. Here's what I believe I felt when I looked up at them and all the isolated people. As I say, no families, no units like my own. All the people cordoned off from me. I believe I saw people that I would one day be called upon to serve as a missionary or in some other facet of my Christian life. And I developed a well-defended position. And you'll smile at it, but it's very serious. And something to think about. It was as if they were all patiently waiting for me to grow up and come to them. And along with this, and I'm trying to and my writing, figure out why these two things go together in my mind so immediately. Along with this were my fears that I would be miserably 
unmarried as a missionary. And I wonder all these years later to what extent my fear of loneliness was an intuition of another kind of truth. That there is no someday. Of course there's some there is a someday. But if you don't go to people right now in your life, then you really can't go to them, at least not the same way. Later on. Crescent City was not an openly brutal place. In many ways, beyond what I have said already, it was a good place, better than most towns I visited as a farmer from the East Coast. In Crescent City, the separation of the races were taken for granted on both sides. Negroes bowed and scraped. Whites felt superior and endured our presence. Their neglect, however, was a benign one. Many stores, such as Hilton Style Shop, Sackett's Grocery, and the Hardware, gave us credit. The bank did too. Our doctors and our one dentist, all white, let Negroes and whites sit in the same waiting room. And the lack of that couldn't happen. They were separated. Many older Negroes and older whites developed a kind of intimacy peculiar to the generation that lived as a master and servant. Still, the differences between our two worlds were, were manifested almost everywhere, especially at Lake Stella, where many children, black and white, spent their summers. We assumed that nature had drawn a line across the lake, separating white side from the Negro side. We swam on and played on the Babylon side, named for the black area where the, where the black graveyard was. <coughs> The whites, of course, when we played on the downtown side. And it had white sand on the shore that the city had brought in. On our side, we had grass and mud and they had mostly shells. Many of the whites had beautiful motorboats, and we ended the white children as they skimmed across the lake on their colorful skis. No Negro could afford a motorboat, and none of us had skis. We enjoyed ourselves playing by creating games. The greatest challenge, which most of us gave with ease, was swimming from our side of Lake Stella to Billy Goat Island. We had the most fun, though, playing a game called Gator. We would draw lots. Whoever drew the shortest marsh reed became the Gator. The game's hockey was to outswim the Gator. And after the Gator caught someone, great struggle would ensue as he tried to pull the captain on the water and hold him there. After freeing himself or being released, the captain would become the navigator. Needless to say, we often came very close to drowning the weakest swimmers. <laughs> but we had fun. <laughs> Even so, racial alienation, we felt it. We felt it deeply. We could not, for example, eat at Thomas Drug Store at the counter there, or at Hap's Diner, which doubled as a Greyhound bus station. When a group of us tried to integrate the drug store counter that afternoon, the owner threatened us with jail and telephoned our principal, Harry Burning, who of course called our parents. You know what happened after that. <laughs> at the time of movie theater, bikes sat downstairs and rose in the balcony. And when they closed the theater and made it into a bowling alley, we were no longer, we could no longer go inside. But the signs of saying that uh, Negroes are no longer allowed. In the fall of 1959, the fall that I was forging notes to the librarian, I came home one day and announced that at my new school there would be no classes on Monday afternoon. The annual Wines Club Minstrel Show started on Monday, and there was a special matinee just for the junior high. <coughs> the school was going to let out around noon. There was even a bus ride arranged to get us over to the recreation center after lunch. The cost of the show, one dime. <coughs> there was a big silence after I made this announcement at home. 
Dad got red in the face. <coughs> Finally, he sputtered. Well, you can't go to that. You don't have my permission to go to something like that. I wish I could remember the conversation that followed. My guess is there wasn't much of one because there almost never was when my daddy got mad. And he was furious. I was confused. This was somehow my fault. My mother and I probably left and went to the kitchen to pretend to be cleaning up. That's what we did. Daddy got mad. He skedaddled. I'm sure it was to her that I complained. If I don't attend the menstrual show, I have to go to the study hall they set up. And my mother was quick to grasp how this might embarrass me, new girl in town, if I was the only one. They'll have to keep a teacher back just because of me. Well, you don't know that, my mother said. There might be all kinds of kids who won't be allowed to go. I've had no trouble remembering the anger in my father's voice. You can't go to something like that. And he couldn't say right then, <coughs> that's racist. And for the young people in the room, we're talking about an all-white men's club um, putting on an annual show in which they would entertain an all-white community wearing blackface. And it's interesting to contemplate what that was all about, especially in 1959. So he couldn't say, that's racist, right then. It would have left so much more to be explained. He would have had to say why the Lions Club was racist. All the white groups of men, some of them would have been in our church, been my teachers, people I knew in everyday life. He would have had to explain, in some real degree, at this point why we were all in this situation. I think all that my father was prepared to say right then was just, no. And what he was feeling must have been something close to alarm, hence the anger. I caught him off guard. I was the bad messenger. He didn't know minstrel shows were still being staged. Weren't things like that safely dead? And as with so many things that he assumed were dead, weren't some things best left unexplained? I suppose my ignorance was alarming to him. It was as if I picked up dirty talk on the street and was now repeating it without knowing what I was talking about. And to tell me what it meant was to get into something very complicated. For a child who's 13 and hasn't been told much. There's your daughter standing there telling you about something in a community that you not only didn't think still existed, but that you never wanted to tell her about in the first place. And so, Daddy just got mad. Now, I'm going to read to you about uh, busing. This is not school busing. You see, that's the one where the court said, uh, we're going to use these buses to have uh, five kids and black kids go to school together. This is busing in the 50s. And so they can bus black kids and keep them away from white kids. This is real busing. And uh, today I laugh at people when they get upset about busing. I don't know what they're talking about. So let me read it to you about busing. Nothing shamed us more than school busing. It's cynical among us to believe that the Almighty Himself had created busing to keep colors away from white children. Until the late 1950s, many students at all black middle school in Crescent City walked between 5 and 5.30 each morning and walked more than a mile to the bus stop to take us to collect it. In the red route by U.S. Highway 17 to Crescent, uh, from Crescent City to the school was about 30 minutes. I'm sorry, 30 miles. But we could not take these that right route. Too many kids lived back in the woods. The driver picked up the current students in the southern region called Long Station. Then she drove north to the other local neighborhoods, Denver, Rossville, Pikesville, Babylon, Union Avenue. Leaving Crescent City, the 30 or more of us went southwest to Georgetown and Cleveland, then northwest to Wilaka. From there we drove northeast to Ramona Park, and then due north on Highway 17 to Satsuma, San Mateo, and East Palenque. We arrived at the school between 8.15 and 
barring any breakdowns of drawbridge in your trunk. During the shortest day of the three hour ride for children. One way. During the shortest days of winter, we left home in the dark and returned in the dark. But we did so happily because we thoroughly enjoyed school. For this reason, our bus rides were fun. And something new happening every day. Many of our long lasting romances began there. <laughs> some who met on that bus are still married some 40 years later. We told one another our deepest secrets there. In time, though, we realized that although school was fun and our bus rides were adventures, we were victims of Jim Crow's intention of cruelty. As our innocence died, and as we absorbed the reality of living as Negroes in the South, play became increasingly more important to us. We escaped the hostility through play. Because we were poor and could not buy ready-made toys and games, we had to invent and build. A group of us performed our greatest building feat after watching Gunsmoke. We built our version of Dodge City. For several weeks, we collected scrap lumber, sheets of tin, and several pounds of nails. We chopped blackjack oaks and palmetto fronds. About five weeks of sewing, hammering, and digging, we had built six mean structures, each with its own crudely painted sign, on branch salon, Doc's office, Marshall Dillon's office in jail, Dodge House Hotel, Derby Stable, church. We were happy. During the day, we played gun smoke and waited in brown brooks teeming with crawdads and tadpoles. At night, we built campfires and roasted hot dogs. We never comprehended the incredible irony of our Dodge City experience. We were Negro children locked in a black world playing white characters and reenacting white situations. And although blacks rarely appeared on the TV show, and although we had no sense of the universality of art and human beings. As we grew older, and as the decade of the 50s neared its end, we played pure unstructured games. Marshall football, basketball, pool, cards, talking trash. Playing pinball at Chuck's Barbershop and flirting with the girls became our new games. At the same time, we would begin to hear the names such as the Reverend Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, and of course, we learned about the Montgomery bus boycott in school. Times were changing. Negroes everywhere were beginning to speak out, and we children too were losing our innocence. The civil rights movement was in full force. Gradually, I became keenly aware of my encounters with white people. Increasingly, I began to notice, I began to refer to all white people as crackers, even though I had no idea what a cracker was. <laughs> Many of my friends and teachers noticed that I was becoming very, very angry. My grandparents became seriously concerned with my changing attitude toward whites after I told Bob Jones, a white insurance agent, to stop eating out of, out of my grandmother's pots on the stove. <coughs> he would collect the money on the same night each month. Invariably, he came while we were eating supper. You all know about that? <laughs> he would knock on the front door with the letters I had. He addressed my grandparents as Lily and Robert, although they were his elders. Mr. Jones would put his briefcase on the floor and march into the kitchen and eat whatever he wanted. My grandparents would not look at me while he was eating, while he banged the pot lids. All the while, he would call out such things as best collard greens in town, Lily. After eating, he never thanked my grandparents. He felt like he was money, belched, and drove away until next time. <laughs> the experience always left me angry and feeling abused. <laughs> One night I told Mr. Jones that he had no right to barge in, to barge in and eat out of our pots. No Negro could do the same in his house. Offended, he turned red in the face and motioned to my grandmother to follow him outside. She returned a few minutes later, 
brown eyes reflecting the pain of having bowed and scraped to survive. Don't never say nothing to that white man, she said. Her face was stern. Yes, ma'am, I said, feeling sorry for her. She had salvaged dignity from her faith in her God and had begun to hum the Negro spiritual, our fly away, as she always did at such times. There were certain parts of the day that I was permitted to see. No one was denying me permission to see newsreels at the movie houses, the ones very lately released some dozen years after World War II. Do you know which ones I'm going to say? That horrific footage from the concentration camps. I knew about those camps. And they were all vaguely of a piece about where we were now in the future and something called the Big Bomb. The Cold War gave us a lot to do with our time and a really good way to name all that was truly evil. In Jacksonville, I was asked to be prepared in a very memorable way concerning that bomb. I had to bring in a canvas bag of canned goods. My mother sewed it herself and put in a two-week supply of food, and all the kids had to have one. They hung on the backs of our desk in plain view for the entire year. Once in a while, we'd have a drill. Should the bomb be headed our way while we were in school, we, taking advantage of the early warning system, <laughs> would grab our sacks and cleverly head as an entire school out across our sports field. Freight cars would be waiting there if this was a real attack, and we would get into these cars apparently and would block be shipped out of Florida to safety, to Georgia. <laughs> preoccupation for the privileged white kids in schools. The violent aspects of the civil rights movement were national news, but I don't recall knowing it at the time. The demonstrations and the great meanings of it dramatically, ideologically, politically, huge change it was going to be. Wonderful change for women one group to follow after. Banning me from going to the Lions Club Minstrel Show was my first real news of it all. <coughs> 1959 would have been before the bombing of a Sunday school and the death of four black children, little girls. The removal of those little girls from my life was not going to be cooperated with by the television set. I could see them on TV, photographs of them and their families. I guess I knew I had seen them before at the shopping center, at the grand opening show. All of them and all of us seated on the tops of our cars, our faces lifted up, our same looks of fear and pleasure as that young girl really does prepare to set herself on fire and jump into that tank. We had all screamed together in delight and relief when she made that perfect, impossible dive. Like all wake-up calls of the century, it would take a bomb to put an end to the Lions Club minstrel shows for most decent folk. Not a bomb from the enemy we were expecting, Soviets, but a bomb from ourselves, planted by us in a black Baptist church. The good thing for me, Mr. Bob Jones, the church station was not the last white dog in my life in Crescent City. My grandmother was a maid, one of her sites was the Crescent City Women's Club. In addition to being a meeting place at 
Cincinnati. It was a local library, housed about 2,000 books. That was, she took me there the first time I got the queen. I went every chance I got. I didn't know most of the authors of the books, but I read all I could. I spent more time reading the queen. At first, my grandmother would scold me for not working. Later, she encouraged me to read. This is Anna Hubbard, a frail white lady who often was there, had a kind face and a caring voice. Apparently, seeing my interest in books, she began to suggest one for me to read. Native Son, The Mice and Men, the Sun Also Rises, Lord Jim, The Last of the Mohegans, and Dracula, which I call as a cobra. <laughs> Here she told me about Dracula. Sometimes Mrs. Hubbard would ask me about my reading. One morning she sat me down and she talked about Native Son. And I was quite embarrassed and ashamed to discuss it because the protagonist, David Thomas, had killed the white woman. Sensing my discomfort, Mrs. Hubbard asked me questions and told me about plot, character, point of view, to take my night off. She also introduced me to A. Philip Randolph, who was born in Crescent City. Although Mrs. Hubbard and I did not become close friends, she sparked my interest in literature and writing. <coughs> Her singular behavior relieved me of some of my growing hatred of white people. And she convinced me that I was smart, that I was a good reader, that I could write. One afternoon, I don't remember why, I told Mrs. Hubbard that I wished that she was one of my teachers, and I'll never forget her reply. That's nice of you, she said. White people can't teach it through school. I told her that I understood, but I did not. The race consciousness that had kept the two of us apart made no sense to me. It was the same thing that had made the deputy in the courthouse do what he did. His actions made no sense to me. The white boy who broke my nose with his belt buckle, why had he done so? Why did Negroes swim on one side of Lake Stella and whites on the other? Why were our football teams kept apart? Why were Negro children bust so far? And why was I, just a child, feeling such a profound contempt for white people? I did not understand. And I suspected that those responsible for the shape of our world at that time did not understand either. Just about the close of our presentation, and we both decided to write or try to speak to you a little closely about, of course, the impending decade, 1960 to 70, in which the civil rights movement for us was something we could, as adults, as young adults, enter and be part of. But this piece was meant really to, to go back to a uh, coming of age time, and it's so heartening to see some young people in the audience right at that time in their own lives, uh, because that's the time so much of how you're going to make your way is starting to be your own. You're figuring it out yourself, you're laying claim to it, and you're being guided at the same time. And for me, going off to college admitted me for life into a liberal community, which gives me great cause for joy and my good fortune. It is the liberal community my parents were pushing me toward all along. I suppose I'm perceived as thinking about this a lot in my novels. I have one novel, Trouble Waters, in which I retell a true story of an incident in Okoe, told to be my, my grandfather. And I have a few scars, I suppose, battle scars from writing about something controversial. But I feel insulated to this day in ways that I'm troubled by, ways that I want to leave you thinking about. Black people are, in my life, as my students, my colleagues, my neighbors in my building, they are my lawyers, 
uh, doctors, editors, the presidents of universities where I'm likely to teach, the Methodist bishop of this very state and the state of New York and all over the United States. But when from the very start, a system has removed from your view a group of people, it is devastating to grasp the huge implications and what all else has been removed and how that will affect you for life. Your imagination, your humanity. In 1964, the year the Civil Rights Bill was passed, I was a freshman at FSU. And one day the press got a hold of something that was going to go on in a church, a big church downtown, mainline Protestant church downtown, been there forever. It was a church that could take a vote legally in their church. They could take a vote as to whether they would admit blacks into their service to worship. My very first sermon at the Wesley Foundation was about this kind of bigotry. The most segregated hour is the church hour our minister preached. And when it got out, how the vote went down, and it didn't go down so well, students on the cusp of this movement went down there at night and planted a sign and called the press so they'd be there the next day to read this sign. And it was the beginnings for me of what you might be able to do in taking your stand. And the sign read, we reserve the right to refuse salvation. <laughs> I'm at the end of my um, presentation, too, but I mean to say that uh, uh, Bev and I spent a week uh, in the fall, last fall, uh, traveling to Crescent City to Hurricane Beach together. So we spent a lot of time together, and uh, it was quite interesting. In Crescent City, we got a chance to go to all the places I described here and more. We got a chance to meet some of the people. Uh, we met a publisher who loves my column. He calls me and said, I want to run your stuff. I said, wonderful. Until he saw us together. <laughs> Something very interesting happened. He no longer, he, he no longer seemed very interested in my column. But a few blocks away, we got a chance to stay at a motel where when I was a kid, I could not walk on the property. It wasn't allowed there. High school now has a black, uh, a black principal, Crescent City. When I was a kid, that would have been unthinkable. Black city commissioner. When I was a kid, we would hardly go into the courthouse, <laughs> city hall. And I'd take your head off. It's a place where we hang. There were black people working there. When I was a kid, uh, that did not happen. White man who owns a Billy Goat Island where I used to trespass with my friends. <laughs> he would chase us away. And he would call us niggers, chase us away. Now this man invites me to his home. Because he's very proud to be from the same town as Bill Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> I was teaching in Gainesville at the college there. Two white kids in my class. I called the roll and I looked at the roll and there's uh, the name Suggs, S U G G S. It's a name from way back in my childhood. I had no idea that uh, it was real here. You know, I asked, I told the kids at the class, you know, I said, when I was a kid, I had a doctor in Crescent City the name was Suggs. But guess what? It was my childhood doctor's children. It's the white kids. And where else could it happen where I'm teaching? I'm teaching kids who were the children of uh, my childhood doctor. I thought that was a strong thing. So things have changed. The present city has changed. Jim Crow is still lingering. But things are better. And I think that you would need your head examined if you thought that uh, 
things were all that different than they used to be. But they're not all that different. We have laws that have been passed. You can't pass laws to change people's hearts. So I think that's what we're trying to get at here with what we're doing, is to get you know, to take a different kind of look at what we're doing. We're not trying to indict the past. We're not trying to apologize for it. We're trying to remove uh, the cloak and say, this is what happened to us as we grew up. And our lives did go like that. And only now have the intersect. So, uh, uh, thank you very much for coming. For example, they, they've assured me they do not know either Ken Starr or Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> <laughs> they are both happy and furious about who won the Super Bowl, and they are not going to endorse any Polk County Commission candidates tonight. <laughs> so if, if you wouldn't mind uh, trying to, to make your question as concise as possible on the point of the program, and maybe, I, I don't think in Polk County this is ever a problem, but Keep it in the spirit of our two authors and of John Willis Menard's Speak to Me Time. Who would like to go first? Yes, ma'am. I'd, I'd like to ask, how did you two get together? Your lives, like you said, are parallel. How did those lives intersect? How did you meet each other? It's sad to think of it going on parallel and never meeting. <laughs> yeah. How did you? Well, um, I got a call from Florida Humanities Council asking if I would write an essay about this and that they, about growing up in the 50s before the Civil Rights Bill was passed, growing up segregated, and that they had asked Bill Maxwell to do the same thing. Now, I'm up in New York City and don't get the St. Pete Times. I didn't know who met, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, but I quickly learned, and um, one of us called each other. I called him, he called me. And by in, in the process of talking, we both realized we had picked the same year to start. You know, when you're a writer, you've got to find a dramatic moment, and we had picked the same year. Uh, so 13, 14 is a, is a crucial time. And we were off and running and uh, eager to write our essays, and so we were very grateful. Uh, Phyllis McEwen took our essays, and she invented this form herself, and that, that amazed us. I think Beverly's answer confirms for us something all us Polk Countyans have suspected, and that's residents of New York City are culturally deprived. We need to get Bill's column published in New York City. Yes, ma'am. Um, I guess in the spirit of uh, we've come so far and yet we really haven't, um, is this was this your traveling companion when you got the incident in the restaurant in Sarasota? No, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Was a, a friend in Gainesville. Okay. Well, you know about that. You read that. All right. Thank God I could get you a column on the internet. Yeah. No, it's a different. No, it's different. All right. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate that you are not. You did not sanitize your presentations, and to tell the truth as it was, I'm not a native Floridian. Uh, I was born in Michigan. Same thing. Mm. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Sir, I had uh, associated with him with uh, speak a, a lot you had to say. See, so I was born in 1923 in Alabama and spent 55 years in Michigan. So one of a lot of things you were saying, and I stayed in Montgomery for part of the time, and uh, left there before Mrs. Parks and having Dr. Parker came here came on the scene. <laughs> but I do know Montgomery, and I know all of Alabama. So I know where you're coming from in Michigan, I'm saying. And I saw that in World War II. So it was, I know where both of y'all are coming from because I've been there. Before I recognize the next person, some of the young people in the audience be thinking, we want questions from you too tonight. So don't be shy. Who had a hand up with you? Yes, sir. Um, when you were speaking, you uh, made a phrase, the burden of superiority. The burden of being in the, of the superior race. Right. Did you feel that? Did you feel it was a burden to have those um, those notions of superiority 
to look at someone and, and not feel that kindred uh, spirit, that brotherhood, the how how did you relate to that? Yes, right? if, if I understand yeah, it, let me right. don't let me change for okay. it. Uh, Bill mentioned that uh, his real awareness that whites had exuded a feeling of superiority over blacks. In your upbringing, did you feel that real sense, that present sense of superiority as part of your life? Did, is that yeah, the diversity? Yeah, you know, um, just at seeing people bend over backwards not to be superior, I felt that I felt it. Uh, there was an incident I thought about writing about, um, and I was a little bit censored because my mother was here tonight, but she's she's a brave soul, and I'm going to tell it. <laughs> and should should we, we introduce your mother? Well, I'd love to, and I'd love to introduce. Actually, well. We'll keep going. We'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> and um, that was a, I would see her work around uh, what we would call the colored maid who would come into the parsonage and work and work and work until this woman was just paralyzed by my mother working because she, my mother truly did not put herself above this kind of work and felt uncomfortable. Uh, but I picked up a lot around that. Uh, the burden of her wanting to prove herself uh, and the other one just being paralyzed I mean I knew she wanted to say why don't you just let me do my job here <laughs> and in those kinds of strain of course I was picking up all that effort um, if that helps and, and, and I, I know I was picking it up everywhere unable to articulate uh, what this was about and I, I just want to make the point we've got to talk to our children uh, we've got to explain things to them as young as they are what's going on Yes, ma'am, in the back. I'm a citizen. I came to America and I was attacked to the first class citizens, even to this day. I don't want to believe it or not. Slavery is alive and well. Discrimination is alive and well. There are two sets of behaviors. You go in the stores, there's one behavior for the night, there's one behavior for the night and you see on a daily basis. So we can kill ourselves as much as we want. We can face up to it, it's very subtle, and we tell our children that we're all just colored. The only difference between us is the color of our skin. When we cut, we hurt just like anybody else. We believe the same way, we have the same feelings, we have the same emotions, and we can stop it because we want to do this place to a, a big harm. And this is hard. I think we can all agree to that. Now, uh, the kids, young people, not kids, I can't say that. The young people, I'm going to start calling on you if you don't raise your hand. Somebody, somebody, please, I'm begging. Well, I, okay, yes, ma'am, in the back. Well, I consider myself young. You look younger than me. <laughs> well, I'm older than you, but I'm still young. Um, I remember the first time I was in the I grew up in Palatka, 
that my, uh, my mother worked at the courthouse. And I say that with a, a heart that's pounding. I'm thankful that she didn't work there in 1959. But, but the reality is that's the environment I grew up in. And I, and I still feel responsibility about that. And a night like this is, it helps some. And I thank you for doing this. A week from Sunday night, I'm a local pastor. There is a network of uh, around 25 congregations in Lakeland that is somewhat in Polk County called PEATS, Pope Ecumenical Action Council for Empowerment. We've been going for about two to three years with a deliberate interdenominational, uh, interdenominational and interracial effort to build reconciliation and work for justice. And a week from this Sunday night, the church where I'm pastor, Lakeside Baptist Church over on New Jersey Road, we're going to have a, a really a, a citywide service that we're calling Peace Telling. And there will be stories like this told, some localized. Uh, and we will be having a litany of repentance, not that that solves everything, but somehow what beats in, our, in my heart and, the, and the, the pain in my stomach needs some spiritual expression. We're going to do that. We're going to also hear stories of reconciliation, some localized. And I think perhaps the best thing we're going to do is that after that service is over, we're going to go uh, eat together. <coughs> And anyone who, who wants to can be a part of forming some small groups, reconciliation groups, that will covenant to meet for uh, about four times uh, in which we build relationships across the racial lines. We have miles and miles and miles to go in this town. We do. Uh, tonight, the Lakeland Vision 2000 is meeting over in Lake Mirror. I was a part of that visioning process. And I was supposed to be there to sort of help help do that. It's our community spinning out a vision for the year 2000 and beyond. Honestly, it took effort, quite frankly, to get our community to recognize in that process that racism is a serious problem in, in Polk County. It did come to the point of recognition, but we've got a lot of work to do. And uh, so, end of commercial. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, it, it underscores so much the importance of to communicate is the beginning of understanding. That, that, that's one for you first and then here. Yes, sir. Um, this is directed to either one of you. What do you believe today is most hindering healing the relationship, healing whatever past scars there are? I mean, in terms of laws or in terms of anything you see today in our modern society? What do you feel is most hindering? Could you repeat the question? Yeah. As I understand it, again, correct me if I'm wrong, he's really asking if y'all will update till today. You've already said in your presentations that things have changed. But what today, in your opinion, hinders further progress most? Is that right? Well, I think there are several things that I haven't thought about that just like that. It's a good question. Um, as a writer, as a newspaper writer, who talks to a lot of people, let me just say this. First of all, President Clinton had a race initiative. He had John O. Franklin lead it, and he understood that we needed to do something about race in this country. That initiative uh, did not get very far. He got shot down, and it was, it was, it was, it was deliberate. And let me just, and, and I don't want to be political. We have a brand of conservatism in the country right now. We have a very, very negative brand of conservatism Amen. that is that is out to destroy things that you're talking about. First of all, the the way to kill any real uh, uh, favorable talk about race is to equate race with affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Say race. The next breath, say a permanent action, guess what you have? You have a battle. And Pete Wilson didn't in California. Well, the Congress wants to come to this state now, and just go south and do the same thing here. And so we have some problems. We also have something else. And I'm talking now about black people. We have now also and, uh, uh, a group that is that's very angry, and they're young. Their music reflects it. 
Am I making sense? Yeah. yeah. The dress reflexes. So we have things that on both sides that we need to, to get over. And, and there's another problem. All of us tend to be in deep denial. Mm -hmm. Lady from Jamaica, we are in deep denial about the reality of what we're involved in. And so there, there's, there, there are many things. It's not just one. There are many. And, there, and there's something else. People who can really do a lot of good aren't doing it. The institutions that can do a lot of good are not carrying their load. Universities are places where we should be enlightened. Instead, we're getting on many of those campuses, we're getting the thing called uh, PC. Well, if, if PC intends to not hurt people's feelings or destroy people, why not be correct? Why not go out of bounds to, to be kind? So we have a lot of problems that we can do. The eloquence of that, can we let that stand? You can imagine, young man, uh, the, the enjoyment I'm having in driving across the state, having these kinds of conversations. And uh, conversation, I'll add. Make a big difference. As we were, this is, this is a tiny detail, but so what a writer does is to, to see things. And people can be like writers and painters by by seeing, by looking, and as we were sitting over at the side, um, Bill Maxwell noticed something, a detail, uh, just as we were about to go on, and uh, in the nervousness and under the stress of that, pointed some uh, tiny detail out to me, and uh, I thought to myself, this is a writer, and, and, and writers are thinkers, and from thinking comes ideas and, uh, and hope that, uh, that all is not lost. Right. Who, who is it? Yes, ma'am. Francisco, this, this side is not great. That's right. I'm proud of it. <laughs> I need a great one to ask the question. First of all, I want to thank all of you for coming, and it's educational, very educational to me, because now I tell myself not to be always emotional, but I, I am. First of all, I want to thank my husband for um, for his ID to come here tonight because I was going to go watch ball game. <laughs> and um, I don't want to tell my life story. Just like Bill said, you can change the law, but you cannot change people's hearts. And that hurts. Ken met me in Vietnam. I was, I'm Chinese, I was born in Vietnam. And I was denied to be married in our church. At the time, I was very naive, 35 years ago. I didn't know because I could marry him because he's black. And the priest who saw me growing up, baptized me, saw me growing up, and he would not marry us. He sent us, he sent me to an American missionary. The reason I tell you that, racism also overseas not just in USA. I was a very devout Catholic. I was the third generation. And my last thing that I want to do with my husband is to walk up the aisle to have a blessing from God to have this marriage in spirit in God's house. And I was denied for that. But at the time, I was so desperate because we were having to leave, he was having to leave Vietnam then. If I don't marry him, that means I cannot live. And this man was kind enough to come back to Vietnam to get me for the second time. Mm -hmm. I think his family probably had a, really had a, had a heart attack already. And I said, well, I got to go with, go with him. <laughs> and so, I, so we went ahead. I have to tell my mother if she knew at the time, she probably died in front of me at, because she wanted us to marry in the church because she was a very devout, a, a holy, very holy woman. And I have to tell the lie, say that there's no time to get married because we had to leave tomorrow. <laughs> and so when we came to U.S., I have a hard time to find someone to marry us. 
in his hometown because and make a story show that one of the priests were kind enough to just give us the blessing uh, one time at the church after Sunday mass. But I want to tell I want to tell you that racism is not just here, it's everywhere. And we need to tell our kids, God bless our three children, and I would tell my kids, you have every right to do the right thing that your heart tells want you to uh, um, lead you to do, but do the right thing. And you are God's children, and we all the same. And, and I have a husband that I really adore and love. And sometimes I fail to tell him how much that meant to me. Thank you. I think I, I think I speak for everybody here when I say he is out of the Yes, ma'am. I have a question. You said earlier when you have written some of your books that some people have kind of criticized that they were a little bit touchy subjects. Have the two of you experienced any criticism or tension since you started speaking together? That's made you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> I, I haven't. Uh, no. I don't, Rips like history? Oh no. No, it's been it's been uplifting. But of course, you're selected. I mean, people who choose to come to this often, uh, you know, are, are stronger leaders than I've been in, in their in their various communities. So we've been welcomed everywhere. Uh, you're probably curious about the incident that Bill Bill described. You. It, 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 it was uh, more shocking in its just coldness, you know, it wasn't as if names were being mentioned or we were told to, to march uh, out of there, but, but a kind of uh, coldness that just came down as this person tried to, you know, we live by gestalt, you know, we, 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 we frame things, we try to put things in a frame and when it doesn't fit in, we're, it, it shows in our faces. And uh, so maybe at the very least he was caught in one of those moments of not being able to read what was happening. Yes, ma'am. You spoke of Ward Connolly coming to Florida. I think that's a good thing. We need to know that there's more than one color out of that white sheet. <laughs> well, I know it doesn't help. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I like that. I think maybe I'll steal that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I have a question, but I do want to uh, sort of expand on what uh, she said about her comments about discrimination going overseas. Um, I was born and raised in Afghanistan, and um, I could see discrimination not necessarily just on skin color, but based on religious, cultural, and cultural, and also other unique characteristics that we all may have. So I've seen it from various perspectives there. Uh, very less, maybe to a very minimum based on skill color, skin color in Afghanistan. However, coming to the United States is very, very strong uh, according to the skin color. But my question is, uh, as a child noticing discrimination in Afghanistan and noticing it as an adult in America, I've noticed that through years of conditioning, whether you consider yourself to be in a superior class or group or uh, inferior class or the way you're conditioned to, it has an impact on people. In Afghanistan, for example, people weren't necessarily discriminated based on skin color, but because they were put in a certain class, perhaps poor family or whatever that might be, they were conditioned a certain way. And there was a tendency for those individuals and children grown up have a tendency to drop out of school thinking, I'll never make it, my parents didn't make it, they dropped out of school, so why should I go? Because I wouldn't be able to make it. Now, some of the comments or some of the thoughts that you all might have based on that conditioning, what might be some of those things in the United States, and how can we overcome that, and what might be some suggestions for us when we see children or adults in that stage to encourage them to overcome that? Is it easy, is it difficult? I just want to need to see some suggestions from you all in that area. Right, and am I right in thinking, really the, the gist of what you're asking is, in addition to skin color, are there other qualities of life that 
pose serious obstacles to overcoming prejudice or living a prejudice-free life here in the United States? Is that and, and most importantly, the conditioning that might have taken place and the psychological impact that it may have had on people and how to overcome that. You know, the U.S. like to think that we're not a, a society of classism, but we aren't a society of classism. If, you know, we, we, in this country, we can't talk about that too much without talking about skin color. Skin color about class is never a proxy for um, skin color in America. Because we are not a homogeneous uh, culture. We have, we, have, we have everything here. But the fact is that not only are blacks in an automatic lower class, they're also black. And so that's added to it. But among blacks, there's gratification. When I was a kid, uh, a person who was Phyllis's complexion, uh, when I was a child, Crescent City, we were the lower class blacks. The fair blacks were uh, the principal, they were mostly the teachers, and guys like me were, were not. If you go to uh, state prison here in the state of Florida right now, you will find that uh, there's a reason that most of the black inmates, they're dark skinned. Most of you don't find many light skinned black inmates. And we can extrapolate about that. We can talk about it. And so, yes, ratification is a big deal in this country. And uh, you do get conditioned to think. I grew up thinking that there was something wrong with me because I am black, dark skinned, and since there's a popular book out, we can talk about it, that I'm black with nappy hair. And so I was conditioned to think that there was something truly wrong with me. And so, yes, I had to overcome some of that stuff. I had to literally, objectively, logically say, wait a minute, you know, I'm a good reader, I can do this stuff. So yes, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but the fact that, is, yes. That, that, that's what I'm looking for. And also, it, sometimes people are conditioned that they actually feel superior to, over somebody else. And that might be, for example, are there whites that still are having a hard time letting that go? In today's society, you always mention that still exists. Of course, all the time. You use the word conditioning a lot. Studies are being made now about uh, looking at leaders in communities, leaders everywhere, to see what the common, what, what do leaders have in common. And I think you'd be really interested to know, as I was, that topping the list, you know, you would think, okay, is it going to be education? It's going to be, you know, you could probably come up with your list, what makes leaders. But topping the list, is this a single significant encounter with otherness at a certain age? A single significant, sustained, and positive encounter with other in in a, a, an early stage of one's life hits that list every time. And every leader who, who you know fills out this evaluation. And if we can sort of think about all the money we pour into education, and, and when are we giving our children? Um, both ways and always uh, something singular that will uh, so we want so we're not talking about conditioning conditioning that's a, such a such a uh, determinist word and I know it's a true word to use in certain contexts single encounter <laughs> it's a little off the subject but I was raised in Polk County to believe anyone from Polk County black or white was superior to anybody else. <laughs> 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 Bill says that's delusion. Uh, Mr. Maxwell, what what in your life or where in your life did your heart or thought processes coin the phrase the burden of superiority? Um, I don't know, but I, I, I always realized, I, I'm, that's a very good question, I'm going to uh, take a walk back through my memory and try to find that place, but uh, I, I, um, I find myself doing it all the time. Uh, as a former classroom professor, I found myself feeling superior to those students sitting out there. And I, I, that becomes a real burden. There's certain responsibilities that go with it. There's certain uh, 
delusions that go with it. There are certain lies that go with it. We have to rationalize it. Privilege. We've privilege. So yes, I mean, it's, if, if any white man thinks that he's better than me, he's, he's, he's deluded and he has a terrible burden. <laughs> <laughs> After Bill said delusional twice, I probably ought to mention we were imperial folk. <laughs> you two are a very dynamic and enlightening duo, and I wonder if you are planning on publishing uh, these essays together, these parallel lives, or and going on perhaps into the next uh, decade. Uh, through the civil rights movement and making it into a book? They, they will be published by the, by the council in their magazine form, right? That's right, in the spring. Yeah, in the spring. spring. Beyond that, I don't know. I've dreamed of people coming to places like this and pulling out a contract. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're that person, I'm Alfred Cobb. Who knows? Maybe a couple more questions, then we no, just to bring it to the American psyche of manifest destiny and white man's burden would, would, would be, uh, I mean, that's just part of who we are, as Andy, uh, Ambassador uh, Young would say, that we're all living in a racist society. It's just part of the, that burden that we have to maintain to keep the house up. And then we all fall down. But it, just uh, growing up in the island of Cuba in my youngest years, as a, missionary family. I, I live in a rainbow environment and I didn't know what black or white was. Those are terminologies that are not a part of the Cuban culture, although there's racism there too. And being hit by Jim Crow as a child coming to the States was, was I had, it had an interesting twist to it. Um, but I, I, I come to the conclusion that the word race doesn't make it, I mean it has terrible implications and burdens that we use as we live in the racist society, but it really shouldn't exist. Um, because it's just not the way we are as God's children. We are cultures, we are peoples, um, all under the same tent, <coughs> dwelling under the same God. So, I, you know, however people want to react to that word race, I, 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 don't, I try not to use it. And that's, that's a nice image, I like that. I'm going to steal that too. Yeah. It's, it's out of the whole idea of the burden is that if you, you all just crunch it, it is a burden. It sure is. The lady in the back has been desperately waiting. I want to preface my statement by saying I don't think war commonly needs to come here to bring Proposition 209. I think we have it here already, it just hasn't been numbered. The one thing I have a concern about is I go throughout my schools, and I mean throughout seven counties which I work in, I see our children who have segregated themselves according to ethnicity. And I'm wondering what will happen with them in the future uh, as it relates to desegregation, because we're totally, as I suppose, they'll tell them no one's not integrated. So what will happen with our youth? How will we bring about change with them? And will that happen? I know it will happen during my lifetime. What will it happen during their lifetime? And how do we go about effective change in that area? Without you. Uh, um, I, I can tell you, my, I, I have kids. And I recall my, my daughter is now 16 years old. My daughter is a cello player. She's very good. And I remember my daughter. Um, She's eight, nine, ten, very cute, very tall girl. Um, she had white friends, <clears throat> white male friends. And uh, when she be, when she got to middle school and started looking like a little lady, suddenly she had no more white male friends. She had fewer white female friends. It's that middle school place where they start to do that. When they get to that point and they're doing that, you don't get them back together. When they get in high school, go to the football game, the black kids are here, the white kids are there, the Hispanic kids are there, you're in deep trouble. You get to the high school years and they're already doing that. That's the problem. When you get to college, I join Kappa. Uh, I don't know who the white frat is. They join that, and guess what happens? 
So if you don't get them in the elementary school and earlier, and they get to middle school and we don't have them, we're in, we're in trouble. So I don't know how we do it except early. Sometimes if we can step out of the way, but we all people, our stuff, our baggage, leave the kids alone. That to me would be a great place to start too. Because we have all, we are spoiled. The kids aren't spoiled. They're pliable. Spoiled means being stuck in all your stuff. But guess who the spoiled people are? They're the old folks like us. And we're the ones who corrupt the children. Well, let's get another question. I, I think oh, this is one. Yeah, we got, I got a limit. They're going to get mad at me if I don't cut this off. Who wants desperately to ask the next two questions? Who is angry? Just like this one.
This program was made possible by the Florida Humanities Council. We come from all over, and we become one state, where we share in the history and become part of the culture that is Florida. The Florida Humanities Council, bringing Floridians together by sharing the stories of our state. And by the National Endowment for the Humanities, 